One of the great fallacies uh, that many scientists have is that everything that is before birth is genetic and that everything that is after birth is learned. This is not the case. There is more genetic material in the cerebral cortex at 10 months, much, much more than there is at birth. What this means is that the genes are spinning out, are programming well into the first year. They don't stop at birth. And the genes that are encoding the connections between those parts of the brain that are coming on later, therefore, are in a very active state well into the first year. Now here again, we can see on a video, speed it up, a nerve cell doing just that, sending out its long axon. Here you can see it coming down, and here's the ends of the neuron. Now, notice it's not just like a piece of wire or a cable, I've been calling it cables, it's a living entity that is incessantly active. Look at all this movement going on, almost like fingertips. These are called growth cones because they're the living part, the live, growing part of the cell that's feeling its way in the environment all the time on the go. Look how beautifully it flutters and flutes around, investigating, testing the water of where it's going to go, ready to make contact with the target. The new technology of brain scanning gives dramatic insights into the functioning and development of the brain and the vital role played by early childhood experiences on the brain structure. Throughout the first two years of life, the brain cells and their wiring are established, closing down connections that are seldom or never used, and reinforcing the ones that are often used, in other words, sculpting the very matter of the brain. The surface of a newborn baby's brain looks quite different to an adult one. One of the few parts that's well developed at birth is the brain stem, at the base of the brain, where it meets the top of the spinal cord. It's part of the brain known as the subcortical or primitive brain and it's responsible for the basic functions of life including the emergency survival reflexes of fight, flight and freeze. Higher functioning areas of the brain can only start to work properly once they've developed an insulating sheath of myelin around each nerve cell. That is the lower parts of the brain and the brain stem etc are well uh, advanced at birth but many parts of the cerebral cortex are not even myelinated at birth. They're not even, essentially at birth you've got a subcortical infant there. And parts of the human brain are not coming online until well into the first year. So as a matter of fact, at 10 months or 12 months, which is the first time when the attachment patterns are measured by the strange situation, I've suggested that the prefrontal areas now for the first time are coming online. Babies are born with a powerful instinct that motivates them to elicit as much care and attention as possible from their caregivers. Babies and toddlers then learn by experience the best way to form relationships with each individual caregiver. Babies can only form a very few close attachment relationships and to do this it's essential for them to have continuous relationships with permanent caregivers the baby will develop a special lasting bond to one of those permanent caregivers who becomes their primary attachment figure, usually but not necessarily the biological mother. But the other attachment figures, including father, remain vital for the child's well-being. The, the growth spurt of the brain is occurring from the last trimester of infancy through the second year. And at that time, the, the brain is more than doubling in size. It's connecting up. But its maturation is experience dependent. It's not as if the genes are encoding how everything is going to fall together. It needs certain types of experiences for the brain to grow. And the most important parts of the brain that we're looking at in the first year to grow by my own thoughts are those parts of the brain that are involved with the emotional and the social functioning of the child. Those are the ones which are embedded in the attachment relationship. In order for those parts of the brain to grow, which is part of the limbic system involved with emotion, certain experiences are needed. Those experiences are embedded in the relationship between the caregiver and, and the infant. If they're positive, if they're regulated, then we'll have an optimal situation and literally the potentiality of the genes will be carried forth to the fullest, so to speak. 
And so now, one of the most important recent discoveries in the last 10 years in biology has been this idea about developmental cell death. The brain does not continue to grow and grow and grow. It organizes, then it disorganizes, then it reorganizes. And the disorganization of the brain, which is the mass of death of billions of neurons and the disconnections of synapses, is part of how the brain is growing as it's reorganizing. Those uh, connections that are not used die off, which is why early enriched environments, which means emotionally and early enriched environments, more so than wonderful little uh, dangling colors and shapes, uh, are key here. As if to say there is something in, there's something necessary that the human need, that the human brain needs in terms of other human contact for it to grow. It's a use it or lose it situation. Cells that fire together, wire together. Cells that do not die together. All babies are individuals and they modify their nurture seeking strategy to cope with the emotional capabilities of their particular caregivers. Not all caregivers will be able to provide sufficiently responsive and sensitive care for the baby to form a secure attachment. Under these circumstances, the baby may use an indirect approach to its caregiver in order to elicit as much comfort and attention as the caregiver can manage to give. And an insecure attachment relationship may become established. This is the period when the brain is undergoing major structural development and the connections the brain cells are making at this time will influence the pattern for making new relationships in the future. There's a strong tendency for the quality of the relationship with the primary attachment figure to become the dominant and long-lasting internal working model of relationships as the child grows up. Alan Shaw uses co-regulate to describe the emotional and neurochemical effects that the mother and child have on one another. The genetic systems that are encoding the connections of the highest parts of the brain that are involved in social and emotional functions, which are literally the hierarchical apex of the limbic system, are spinning out at 10, 12 months. Those, gen those genes are being affected by the hormones that are being stimulated in the relationship between the mother and the infant. Because when the mother and the infant are in a dyadic dance, when they're attuned to each other, the work of Hofer is now showing that literally their psychobiological systems are co-regulating each other. And that, for example, their, their opiate systems, their endorphin systems are now mutually regulating each other. But we know for a fact that the endorphin systems regulate genes. Positively, We also know that cortisol, which is the stress hormone, also directly regulates genes. What I'm saying by, by this is that the, the attachment relationship is directly regulating the genome. It's directly regulating the way that the genes are going to encode the proteins, etc. This goes far from the idea about what is nature and what is nurture. They're coming together, and it's been said that literally the first gene-environment interactions are found in the psychobiological interaction between the mother and the infant. One thing that usually happens in a child's early experience is they develop a sense of connection with other people. By caring about our infants and children, we not only teach them to accept care, we give them the experience of and the sense of being fundamentally connected with other people. It's this connection that underlies empathy and fundamentally underlies the control of aggression. If the care is able to respond to a baby's cues for attention with sensitivity that's neither too slow and neglectful nor too abrupt and controlling but appropriate and predictable the baby will start to develop a confident and trusting relationship. There are no hard and fast rules to this behavior. But if the carer is in tune in this way, the baby develops a sense of secure attachment and high self-esteem. In fact, it's probably rarely examined. I don't think children with high self-esteem think as they start their day, well, I'm secure, things will work out for me today probably. 
it doesn't have to be examined. It goes without saying. It's a certainty. It's part of them. What I mean by that is it, it comes from inside. It's an abiding belief that things will work out for you. A carer who can see the baby as a real person and is responsive to the baby's attempts to communicate will give the baby an opportunity to have a straightforward and confident relationship. The baby then has a positive model of how another person feels towards them, essential for forming long-lasting friendships. The right hemisphere ultimately comes, becomes dominant in the humans for social functions, for emotional functions, for the processing of social emotional information. It also becomes dominant for empathy, for the ability to empathically understand the states of other human beings, to be able to read their intentions. This is done at levels, at unconscious levels. This is done at intuitive levels. The main uh, support we have for controlling our aggression is the fact that we can empathize with the other person. Injuring another person, we're prone to rather feeling ourselves. We recognize what that other person is feeling. And normally, we can feel their pain. And therefore, when we give pain to another person, it's uncomfortable to us ourselves. What the attachment relationship is, is a combination of the psychobiological predisposition of a particular infant, which is genetically encoded, and the interactive experiences that the child has with the caregiver. The most significant predictor for a child to become securely attached is for the child to have an attachment figure who has a realistic and coherent insight into how their own childhood relationships worked with their attachment figures. In other words, for the child to have a securely attached caregiver. Attachment behavior helps to provide a safe environment for a baby to be adventurous and explore the exciting and unfamiliar world. A caregiver that shares the baby's joy and excitement in exploration actively stimulates brain growth. Most of the studies that have come out of animals have focused on anxiety as being the key affect. The problem is that with human beings in the first year of life, joy is much more the key to the attachment by um, joining with the child in making this dyadic system what they are doing is they are interactively co-regulating very high levels of positive emotion so essentially what the attachment relationship is an interactive mechanism for generating very high levels of positive affect and the positive affect this goes to the work of Tompkins etc is enjoyment joy and interest excitement